Believe it or not, this was my reaction when Cyberpunk 2077 was released. But why was I happy that the most anticipated and hyped game of the generation was a buggy disappointment? Well, I won't lie to you. It's because I had finally gotten my revenge on CD Pro Obsidian. What? Alright, this is going to require some backstory. When I started college and got my own laptop, I officially got into gaming. I got my hands on many titles for dirt cheap and I fell in love with several of them. Among those games were Knights of the Old Republic and Fallout 3. Then I played the sequels to both games, which were both made by Obsidian Entertainment. And... I didn't quite like them as much. What? Are you, are you out of your mind? And that's the problem I have. These games, and that mythical game that was released in 2015, have created a rift in the RPG community. To this day, you are in either one of two camps. Biothesda or CD Pro Obsidian. And from what I've seen, the latter is one of the most heinous and hateful communities I have ever seen. It was so toxic that I clung so hard to the opposite camp. As a result, I made two mistakes. Yet, even after those disastrous releases, I just couldn't join CD Pro Obsidian. Hating on Biothesda isn't fun. I was upset that the companies that made my favorite games and stories weren't what they used to be, but at the same time, the alternative just couldn't fill that void Biothesda left behind. But that's crazy! Isn't it an accepted fact that these games are objectively better than the alternatives? Well, at least in New Vegas' case because I haven't played the other one yet, it is a good game and the creators are good at making stories. But, at least for me, they don't make the stories that I want. When I played Knights of the Old Republic 1 for the first time, I fell in love with it. From the moment you wake up on the Ender Spire, escape from Taris, hunt down the star maps, witness THAT moment, and defeat your foe in an epic final battle, you are completely enraptured by the Bioware magic. When I finished the game, I was extremely satisfied with my experience with the greatest Star Wars story since the original trilogy. When it came time to play the sequel, I was enthralled to reunite with my team and... Why isn't there more outrage over this? Does Kreia alone make up for the fact that Obsidian Alien 3 the last game? Well, she doesn't for me. I just can't let go of the fact that all I accomplished in KOTOR 1 was thrown into the garbage off screen just because Obsidian wanted to invisible war the endings. <sighs> Regardless, I coasted along with my band of mostly new characters. Some were very interesting, others were unnecessary. And one was very, very unlikable. So, I go through the motions, finding the remaining Jedi, listen to Kreia's famous monologues, battle three main antagonists, then witness that moment. What kind of shit ending is that? Perhaps I could have liked KOTOR 2 more if it was actually finished and didn't come with the baggage of tearing the first game to shreds. But, I just can't. Anyway, whether I liked it or not, Obsidian's unfinished classic set a precedent for their identity. If Bioware was the whimsical and optimistic yin, then Obsidian was the bleak and cynical yang. And this image would be reaffirmed with their next game that ironically would also come off the coattails of another smash hit. When I played Fallout 3 for the first time, it felt like a classic hero's journey. You are a young hero who is forced out of their home into a harsh world. And from there, you would go on an epic journey that would change yourself and the world forever. And when I finished the story, I felt the same way when I finished KOTOR 1. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place. But the Lone Wanderer refused to surrender to the vices that had claimed so many others. The values passed on from father to child. Selflessness, compassion, honor guided this noble soul through countless trials and triumphs. And let's be honest, is there anything more badass than the Lone Wanderer and his faithful super mutant sidekick bringing righteous justice to the wasteland? Once that story was done, I proceeded to the Mojave for the next adventure. 
When I woke up in the doctor's office, things started off rather nice, if a bit different. I wasn't someone who ventured into a new land to explore. I was already a resident who came back from the dead and had no real established backstory. So, I made some friends and enemies on my journey to find the man who shot me. Then after finding him, seducing him, and killing him in his sleep, I recovered the package and was given the ultimate decision of who would rule the Mojave Wasteland. Being the ideal person I am, I sided with the NCR to burn the murderous legion to the ground. Then after the Battle of Hoover Dam, the ending played out and things seemed to be looking up for every wa- Good Springs saw more trade along I-15 after NCR gained control of the Mojave Wasteland. But with that came a heavy burden of the Republic's taxes. Some old-timers, unable to handle the cost, were forced to move on, grumbling all the while. <sighs> yeah. The objectively best ending is the one where the town you are indebted to for saving your life is bled dry and reduced to bone. Now you might say, that's because the NCR is a flawed nation repeating the same mistakes as the old world. So, the better option should be yes man, right? Because I'm sure as hell not going to be siding with the slaver nation or Andrew Ryan trying to make Rapture 2.0. And yes, Good Springs does benefit greatly from yes man's rule, but in a hilarious twist, Everyone else gets screwed over. After the courier ensured New Vegas remained free, the followers found that independent Vegas was even more unstable and violent than before. Old Mormon Fort became excessively burdened by the influx of patients, struggling to provide even the most basic of services. Now you might be thinking, I'm just a whiny bitch because I didn't get what I wanted and don't appreciate the thought and effort that went into the philosophies of these factions. Well. I do appreciate the philosophies presented, but it still doesn't make me feel any better for aiding a lesser evil. In fact, I'm going to have a good friend of mine explain our problem with this setup. You're up, DJ Peach Cobbler. The few times that I've put in the effort to really learn the different factions in an RPG, I always learn that they're all just different shades of fucking crazy, and I end up feeling like I wasted my time. Every RPG I've played just asks me to pick the lesser of two evils. So, here's a question. Why? Why would I want to do that? If I have to choose between the lesser of two evils, I'm just not going to play your fucking game. Do I want to support the Legion, who literally crucify people, or the NCR, a weak corrupt bureaucracy? Obviously, a shitty weak government that only claims to support its people is preferable to goddamn lunatics and football pads, but I don't want to pick the lesser of two evils. That's not fun. Characters that are insane are not relatable or compelling. I don't like choosing between different groups of crazy bastards or crazy bastards and people that are fucking incompetent. That's not fun. That's not interesting. Choosing between them doesn't make me think about what I value or who I am as a person. Now you might be saying, well, that's just how the world works. There are factions and you side with the one you most agree with. Well, what if I don't want to side with these factions? Why can't I create something that isn't weighed down by corrupt and inept bureaucracy or lead to total anarchy? When I played Fallout 4, I felt a similar experience when I played Fallout 3. A person is thrown into the world he once knew to see it ravaged by the war he so desperately wanted to leave behind. But even with the world destroyed and the murder of his wife, he rose to the occasion with a group of people who believed in a better world. Though he failed in getting his son back, he found a new calling with his new friends to unite the Commonwealth and end the Institute's reign of terror. And yet, this story, with interesting companions, improved shooting, and a very hopeful ending, is lambasted, bastardized, shamed, and everyone who likes it is deemed a heretic and need to be sacrificed to the god of CD Pro Obsidian. And while criticisms are valid, like the downgraded RPG mechanics and limited dialogue, Fallout 4 is still a fun game. And here's a hot take. Say what you want about the Minutemen and their broken record of a leader, but at least siding with them makes sense. They want to unite the Commonwealth by working together instead of being under the banner of a large nation who lost sight of the everyday people they are supposed to protect. Perhaps the game would be better received if there was more interaction between the Minutemen and the other factions. Like instead of having Sturgis build the teleporter right away, there could be a vital component that needs to be acquired by having the Minutemen ally with either the Brotherhood or the Railroad. But there'd also be an option to jump through a few more hoops to peacefully remove Maxim from power and have the Brotherhood spare the Railroad and avoid destroying each other. Anyway, I loved Knights of the Old Republic, Fallout 3, and Fallout 4. When I played KOTOR 2 in New Vegas, 
I enjoyed them, but there were several things that kept me from loving them as much as those of the Yin. Remember, I never said I don't like New Vegas. I really do like this game. If I didn't, then I wouldn't have put over 300 and a half hours into it. I just don't love it. But everyone else does. Almost too much. The things I do for love. Nowadays, it's only New Vegas. Everywhere you look, there is someone praising this game. Almost to the point of deification. Actually, no. Fetidization. And along with this fetidization, there comes bastardization. If you don't do your daily threesome with New Vegas and Witcher 3, while simultaneously bludgeoning Biothesta to death, you are to be nailed to the cross as a sacrifice to CD Pro Obsidian. But you might be thinking, it's justified to criticize the mistakes the companies make so they can do better, right? Well, that's not what I'm seeing from all these videos that are coming up in my feed. The way I see it, these people don't want Biothesta to do better. They want them to be destroyed. They want to throw Todd Howard and Casey Hudson into the fiery pits of hell and give their IPs to their god. Well, I'm going to say this right now. I don't want Obsidian to make a Mass Effect game. Ever. The reason Mass Effect is my favorite game series of all time is because it is perhaps the most optimistic science fiction story since Star Trek. If Obsidian got their hands on it, they would surely make an outright pessimistic story just like what they did to KOTOR. And this is the reason I don't love Obsidian. Every story I have come across with them, preferably their most iconic ones, are laced with so much pessimism. If every choice I make in the game is going to lead to bad things, if every faction is just a different shade of a lesser evil, then I need to ask the question, what is the point in trying? It's a trend in gaming that's been bothering me thanks to the fetishization of New Vegas. Every single RPG needs to have so many shades of gray that the writers have to jump through logical loopholes to make almost every choice gray. And that's one of the reasons I made those two mistakes. It's because I desperately want those optimistic stories I adored so much again. But from the vibe the cult of CD Pro Obsidian has brought, it seems the only stories that should be made are of the Yang and the stories of the Yin need to be shunned. No more KOTOR 1, only KOTOR 2. No more Fallout 3, only New Vegas. No more Star Wars, only Empire Strikes Back. No more Lord of the Rings, only Game of Thrones. No more Superman, only Homelander. <sighs> so, I need to ask the question. Have my beliefs in heroes made me outdated? Does every game need to have constant gray and I can't feel good about myself by the end? Does every story that deals with morally confusing subjects have to have every ending have a disgusting catch to hammer the point home that nothing is good in the world? I... I don't know. Anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you all. I just miss the great stories of triumph and heroes, and the stories that are constantly shoved in my face just don't fill that gap. Perhaps there might be some hope with the recent news regarding Biothesda. But then again... I might be a corporate shill for having hope for the has-beens of the industry. Even so, I do hope someday we can finally have an RPG that deals with the morally complex issues of the world, but with a positive demeanor, there can be a way to navigate the rocky road, and everything can change for the better. But until that day comes, I'm going on a massive RPG binge in preparation for the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Hopefully when I get to the end, I won't become a hateful person and turn on my favorite games like what happened to so many people. Anyway, this was something I wanted to share for years now. And now that I finally got the time, microphone, and voice, I was able to say what I wanted to say. Do you agree or disagree with me? Do you think New Vegas deserves the overwhelming praise it gets even with the detriment of everything else? And more importantly, are there any games out there that have the overwhelming positivity to fill that void in my soul? I hope you found something interesting in this video, and I'm open to any comments. Also, big shout out to my buddy DJ Peach Cobbler. Go out and check out his channel. He deserves the subs more than I ever will. Thanks for being the one to inspire me to make videos. I hope my subpar animation skills didn't do too much of a disservice to you. Anyway, thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. See you next time.